diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, cancers, and osteoporosis. Can I see a show of hands of anybody who knows anybody with this, any of those diseases I've mentioned? <laughs> okay, look around you. I don't see, okay, hands down. How many, a show of hands of people who don't know anybody with diabetes, osteoporosis, uh, osteoarthritis, hypertension, cancers, anybody? Not one show of hands. It's pretty shocking, isn't it? Oh, there's one. You're absolutely unique. Totally unique. Okay, it says illnesses over there. These are food-related illnesses. We're, we on planet Earth, there's 7 billion people on planet Earth today. The statistics I'm gonna show, tell you are actually quite shocking. A billion people suffer from obesity, and there are a billion people suffering from famine. Something isn't right. So what are the Kenya statistics? In February this year, statistics were out from the Ministry of Health. We have four million obese in Kenya, which is 10% of our population. In the States, the percentages are up as high as 31, 32%. In Europe, 29%. So we're not far behind, and we're catching up fast. And sadly, in Kenya, the majority of people suffering from obesity are children. Why? Is it because of the food we eat? Big question. Let's look at the causes of food disorders. Consumption of too many carbohydrates and our predisposition to sweet things. As humans, we like sweet things. Very, very few of us actually don't. Lack of exercise is one, and there's a small percentage of people who actually gain weight and may be termed as being obese due to genetical factors. But the primary cause of obesity in America has got to do with the carbohydrates consumed in high caloric drinks. And that's quite shocking. I'm gonna talk a lot about what's happening in America because I think in Kenya we have to be able to look at what's happened in developing countries in order to see the path that we're following so that we can make decisions on not falling into the same problems that we see happening there. That looks like a, every a weekly shopping list, doesn't it? Mince pies, chicken, mustard, ketchup, shampoo, and then funny little things in there, glucose, ethanol. Does anyone in the room, can anyone tell me what common denominator all of those products have? Corn. There's corn in your toothpaste. There's corn in your ice cream. There's corn in your yogurt. There's corn in everything. Fritz Haber when he got the Nobel Prize, it's shocking, isn't it? He produced the gases that they use in the concentration camps. The fossil, fossil fuels that, we use, that are used now in agriculture to grow food were part of his creation as well. He got a Nobel Prize for killing people, feeding people. Vandana Shiva, who's an Indian activist, I love what she says. The end of that says, we're still eating the leftovers of World War II. And that's quite shocking as well. What happens when we have got no more fossil fuel to grow our food? So in America, there's a system called the deficiency payment system where farmers are actually paid irrespective of whether they sell their crops, especially in the case of corn. What it encourages farmers to do, they're paid the subsidy. It encourages them to grow more corn. With more corn, the prices of corn go down. And in order to keep up and pay their bills, they have to produce even more corn and get even more of these um, deficiency payments. So there's a lot of corn. 50% of all of the fossil fuels, all of the fertilizers used on the planet today go into the production of corn. That you've got in your toothpaste and your yogurt. So who's going to eat all this corn? There's mountains of corn out there. We eat some. Animals in factory farms are fed some. And the rest is processed into all of those things that were on that list and more. There's even corn in your vehicle parts. In the industrial meat um, production, this is quite shocking. Beef, chicken, pork. Animals are fed on grain-based diets that they're not actually meant to eat. In the case of cows, they 
create too much acidity in their stomach and actually bore holes through their stomach. And the only way to keep them alive is to force feed them antibiotics. But it comes to a point where even the amount of antibiotics, the animals still can't, can't live any further. And at that point, you slaughter them. And that's happening with many animals that are being fed these corn-based diets. And the reason is, as I've said, it's just a way of trying to maximize the use of these mountains of corns. And there are other cereals that follow. Same line. It's not very happy. It's a sad state of affairs. We've got an ailing population. We've got a sick planet. And it's largely due to land use, mainly under agriculture. Over the last 40 years, 40% 40 of land has been converted to land use for agriculture. That's a lot of land, considering that not all land is arable. This is a very shocking statistic. Jonathan Foley came up with this. 35% of global photosynthesis is in the hands of humans. We don't only control the quality of food and water. We're beginning to control the quality of the air we breathe. Water use has tripled in 50 years mainly due to agriculture, and 50% of the water available is already co-opted. We don't have that much more. And, our, and as we know, the, uh, by, what is it, in the next few years, we're looking at, the next five, 10 years, we're looking at a population of, is it as little as five or 10 years, I'm not 100% sure, of nine billion. That's happening quite quickly. The figure over there isn't 70%, it's 700%. And this is what the results, the, these are the results on the planet at the moment. Soil degradation, reduced biodiversity, and dead coastal zones. We're literally killing the planet. And one big contributing factor to that is the way we conduct agriculture. Does anybody know where this picture came from? Business Daily. It's great, isn't it? I mean, it looks like they're doing a, a good job. They're following all the, the gap measures. Those are the global um, agricultural practices, good agricultural practices. They've got their gear on. They've got their masks on. They've got a bit of plastic to protect them. And they're walking through fields of wheat. Could be barley. In a mechanized or an industrialized system, tractors would be used to do this. But as we take on industrialized production of crops and things in Africa, and we don't have the finance to mechanize it to the T, we do things like this. These guys are walking through the spray they're spraying. Chances are it was a systemic pesticide, which means that it'll be absorbed through the cell walls of the plants. Chances are they're soaked in it. So not only do we put our soils and our groundwater at risk, the very people who are out there producing our food using the system are at risk themselves. <laughs> OK, I expect you all to go like this. Come on, everybody. Yeah? So that's an organic farmer. He doesn't need all that protective gear. This is a guy in Moranga. So what are the differences? Conventional agriculture largely ignores soils. We feed the plants in conventional agriculture by putting fossil salts into the soils and spraying pesticides on top when our plants are weak and they can't actually grow under those conditions. Organic agriculture, on the other hand, sustainable biodynamic, there are many terms used for, for, for this type of agriculture, build soils. And how do we build soils? This is the back of just about any village hut all over Africa. And there's mounds of animal waste and farmyard um, waste in the picture. In organic agriculture, we use all of this stuff. It is the building blocks of our soil. We make compost. We use animal manures. We use green manures, which are plants, and some natural inputs, rocks for salts that may be lacking. Majingu rock phosphate for phosphates that may be lacking. But over the last 50 years in Kenya, we have been, I would almost say, brainwashed that we cannot produce agricultural food. Oh, sorry, we cannot produce food without using fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers. And a lot of farmers actually don't know how to produce their composts 
and how to actually farm this way. But we're teaching. And we have a small organic movement in Kenya. We have an organic networking body. We have a certification body. And we have a system trying to bring clean, healthy food to the people of Kenya that basically starts by feeding the soils. Okay, the bottom line, organic farming encourages biodiversity. When we test body products, shampoos or skin products, do you remember in the old days, they used to test it on animals first to see if it irritated their skin? Did we ever test food on the insects to see if it irritated them? We never have. We just spray them in conventional agriculture. In organic agriculture, we don't. We actually try to create as much biodiversity and insect diversity as possible because that's what creates the balances um, in nature. So I say, if it's good enough for these guys to eat, then it's good enough for these guys to eat too. So when you find your slugs and your insects and everything on your vegetables, just be sure that it's probably really healthy. And when it's clean, when you're buying it from the supermarket and it's clean and it looks fantastic and it's shiny and it's great and it's important, whatever, just be no, you're ingesting chemicals, you're ingesting pesticides, you're ingesting toxins. The challenges of organic producers. In 2006, the Kenya Organic Agriculture Network did tests on organic, well, not on organic, on vegetables all over Nairobi. They picked up samples from supermarkets, kiosks, markets, etc. And the findings were absolutely shocking. They were then printed in the daily paper. The maximum residue levels of produce, of chemicals allowed to leave in produce from Kenya are set by the international bodies. Our produce tested in Nairobi was between 300 and 1,000 percent higher than these residues, than these residue levels, and that is absolutely shocking. Since then, this year I hear, the Ministry of Agriculture have done tests. Kefis has been told not to release the results because it will create chaos. So that's how bad it is. You have to be aware of what you're eating. So the organic farmers, what are their problems? And why haven't we got a massive movement in this country? First one, if I look at information, there's not a lot of information going out to the farmers. The big players are very much um, involved in trying to get inputs and fertilizers and pesticides out to the farmers, thinking that this is the way forward. We do have a small grouping of very dedicated information service um, providers for the organic sector. And I would like to mention at this stage that BioVision, which is a Swiss NGO, has produced not only a magazine, the Organic Farmer magazine, not only a web-based platform, Infonet, a radio program on Tuesday, every Tuesday for 15 minutes, but also little information kiosks around the country trying to help train farmers and give farmers information that's not readily available elsehow. In markets, thankfully, in Africa, there's only one supermarket chain that has got dedicated space to organic produce, and that is Nakumat Supermarket here in Kenya, which is great. We have a certification body, but the costs are high. Hans Heron, who's the president of the Millennium Institution, says, why should farmers who are looking after the planet pay a penalty by paying for a license to do so? Surely, we should flip the coin and say, Every farmer who produces conventionally should pay for the damage that they're doing to the environment. That should go into subsidized costs for, for organic farmers to prove the integrity that they are producing organically. And then there's new technologies. Farmers don't have access to new technologies. And then there's consumer awareness. Hands up any of you who knew what I've just told you about the organic sector in Kenya. So we're doing really badly. There's three hands up in the crowd. We're doing really badly at letting you know and that's why I like being a TED Fellow, because I said I will use this platform to let people know. And then there's, <coughs> excuse me, value addition. Agriculture in Africa per se, um, as we've seen from um, hereditary reasons, land sizes, land plots are becoming smaller. Farmers need to be able to learn about value addition so that they can raise the value of their products and realize a higher income. Climate change is not a lot we can do about it, but we can try to put in systems that will help to mitigate the risk for the farmers. They're still happy. They're still out there learning, coming to the market, still producing. The bigger factor overall, if I go back to this picture here and here, it's a, it's, this is a global problem. Our farmers globally are getting very old. 
It's a hard, hard, hard career to be in. In America, the average age of farmers is anywhere between 55 and 65. In Japan, it's up to 70. In Kenya, we're up in the 45, up close to 50. And we need to focus on encouraging the youth back into agriculture. But they're not going to do it in, Af in Africa by picking up djembes and going out into the hot sun. We need to create incentives that will enable them to realize an income, and profitable incomes. They are, after all, the food producers. And take away food, what have we got? This is Victor Motola. He's in Kibera. That's a little farm in Kibera started in just after the post-electoral violence. It was a garbage site. They turned it into a little food producing area. And he and his group now not only feed their families, but they also sell products. So they've got a little business. That's Mohammed on the side in Givinji. Mohammed was working with Victor and is the chairman of their group. He learned how to install drip irrigation while putting in the system. And now he actually works on consultancy to help other people install drip irrigation. Technologies, they're making money and they're going back into farming. OK, you're all supposed to be on this side now. Drip irrigation. The introduction to, of drip irrigation in Africa has largely been the big exporters, flower growers, and big exporters of horticultural project products. And the small-scale farmers don't know that actually we have companies in this country producing these products, and it is affordable to do it on a small scale. This is a little greenhouse. Um, on the far right, there's Stella and Disho. She didn't actually come out in the picture. Young women, a young um, University of Nairobi graduate who decided not to carry on doing anything else but to get her feet stuck in agriculture, and she's doing very well. Small mechanized agriculture, that we can work our small fields. These are the things we need to enable the youth in order to get the youth back into the, <coughs> excuse me, into the fields. And looking at the tools that we have today, we do know that um, in Africa now, the fastest growth in any sector is mobile telephony. Soon, everyone's going to have a mobile phone or access to. And we can use these to deliver information, agricultural information, to the farmers. A lot of the mobile apps that have been developed to date are um, games in Europe, games, um, social applications, etc. But we can start using these in Africa to deliver real, relevant information to various sectors. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. But there's one other thing that we get out of organic agriculture. And I want to share with you, I want to introduce you to a very good friend of mine. His name is Matope. He loved playing in the mud, and this was the first day he decided to take a bath. He's never gone in there before. Wow. recognize the, um, the needs of the animals around you. Mashka, how can you let it can be happen? so much fun. He had just been chased by a donkey and was really, really hot. And he came down. He never went in the bath before, and he didn't even hesitate to get in. He just jumped in. What's his name? Up. Matope. He was named Matope because he, when we got him, uh, we got stuck in the river, and he was squealing in the back of the car. And as we tried to get the car out of the mud, <laughs> And I couldn't bear the noise he was making anymore. I put him on the ground, and all he wanted to do was play in the mud, and he just started rolling in the mud. Do you still have him? Yeah, yeah. This, picture, this, this video was taken about four days ago. Oh, wow. Okay. Watch what he does. 